So vegetative diatoms, that is normally growing cells, they're never ciliated and they lack centrioles, but diatoms turn out to be sexual. This wasn't in fact definitively shown until something like the 1950s. Diatoms do reproduce sexually and when they do, they produce eggs and sperm. The sperm are motile. They develop a centriole de novo. That's a third kind of microtubule organizing center that diatoms make in addition to the interphase microtubule center and the, the plates at the end of the diatom mitotic apparatus. The sperm include, in addition to the kinds of things that you might expect to find in an animal sperm, they might include plastids, mitochondrion, of course, often a vacuole, especially for freshwater forms. Uh, and a curious feature that I want to highlight is that this sperm does not swim that way like an animal sperm. It swims that way like most of the rest of the uh, group they belong to. And these, this flagellum that they make is decorated with hairs. The word for these hairs is mastigonemes. This so-called tinsel flagellum is the characteristic that gives the group, the stromenopiles, its name. Because these hairs are sticking out to the side, the flagellar waveform creates thrust that drives the cell that way instead of that way. At any rate, so diatoms make sperm. Uh, spermatocytes go through meiosis, of course, what else would they do? Starting with um, some cell that's committed to this pathway, um, the vegetative cell might go through a succession of, of, of rapid mitotic divisions, but the cell that undergoes meiosis produces for sperm, just like you would expect for haploid sperm. In doing so, it might be that this initial division produces a biflagellate intermediate and simply divides the cytoplasm of the parental cell. However, it is also a feature of some species spermatogenesis, in particular the ones, the one that I hope students taking the lab get to see for themselves, that instead of dividing everything up equally, this body um, becomes uh, a quadriflagellate thing. Plast is in there still. Uh, 
and to make the sperm as small a propagule as possible, the division carves off from the cytoplasmic mass four plastid free relatively small things leaving behind a body containing uh, no nucleus but much of the cytoplasm this residual body of course doesn't have any future without a nucleus So that's uh, spermatogenesis. During oogenesis, um, a cell committed to making eggs, again, it's going to go through meiosis and from meiotic prophase, it might divide equally to make diploid daughters that then do something a little different. They undergo an internal second meiosis to produce a haploid nucleus and a degenerating and a degenerating nucleus containing the other product of second meiosis. Okay, so perhaps the point as an animal oogenesis is to preserve cell volume. Centric diatoms, I should say, are anisogamous. And what I'm saying here applies to the centric diatoms. I'll mention in a minute um, penates are a little different. Penates are isogamous. Meaning that their gametes are the same. Okay, alternatively, uh, this cell could divide um, to make a polar body-like throwaway product. Excuse me, that's supposed to be approximately the same size here. Whereupon this thing goes on to make a large haploid cell with another throwaway product internally. And um, I'm running out of room on the board here, but you can imagine there are also some where the division conserves all of the um, cytoplasm and all of the throwaway meiotic products are retained within the egg cell in an operation equivalent to the formation of polar bodies during animal female meiosis. Now, of course, what happens when sperm and egg gets together? Fertilization produces a zygote. What else would it produce? So we've got our little sperm here. Now an egg among diatoms has to have some sort of uh, interface to admit the sperm. So the frustule, excuse me, it's got to fit together, right? The frustule has to open up a little bit. If this is the protoplast inside there, there has to be some sort of accessible place 
there's the egg's nucleus, some sort of accessible spot on the egg cell that the sperm can fuse with. Uh, funny story, uh, one of my brothers went to do his postdoc working on uh, diatom sexuality and its relation to their ecology. One of his first discoveries was diatom sperm stick to glass really well. Of course they do. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, uh, he had another, um, his second discovery was that the model diatom that he had intended to work with had been in culture so long that it lost the ability to sexually reproduce. In fact, had lost many of the genes required for meiosis and recombination. So uh, we'll get back to why that's striking in a second. Um, at any rate, fusion of these produces, again, a zygote. The zygote's got these two nuclei in it. They'll get together, if all goes well. Oops, let me try and keep the sizes right because this is a story about cell size in part. Let's try and keep those sizes similar for reasons that we'll outline in a second. Unlike in animals, where the egg is often the biggest cell in the life cycle, in diatoms, the egg is often one of the smallest cells in the life cycle, except for the sperm itself. So it's wearing its little hats here. The frustule. That's the zygote. And the zygote escapes from the frustule, although it still might be wearing it for quite a while. Again, the one that I hope students taking the lab class get to see, this is um, pretty dramatic, the zygote swells up out of its fresh shell into a great big spherical cell with that diploid nucleus in it somewhere. This is called the oxospore. Now, it's not a naked cell entirely. The oxospore actually has uh, uh, surface coating of siliceous scales, silica scales, not a monolithic pair of valves like the frustule, but it is surrounded by a coat of scales. Inside the oxyspore, oops, too big. Again, I'm trying to keep the sizes right here. Inside the oxyspore, eventually forms what's called the initial cell. And the initial cell, it's diploid, and it has a new frustule with two shiny new valves, much bigger than the old ones. Now, as it happens to make these two valves, it goes through two internal mitoses, producing two throwaway nuclei, similar to meiosis, and that is because, if you recall from the last lecture, the formation of a valve is associated with the completion of mitosis. So in order to make two new valves inside the oxyspore, the initial cell undergoes two internal mitoses, one of which is involved in the production of the epivalve, the new epivalve, and the 
second of which is involved in the production of the new hypovalve fitting within the epivalve. Now, the importance of this is that once it hatches out, this initial cell has reset the size of its shell, of its frustule, so that vegetative division following sex begins from the largest cell size that this particular uh, individual felt it could produce. So mitosis progressively reduces cell size because every time this cell goes through mitosis, whoever inherits the hypovalve has to make a smaller new hypovalve that fits within it and so on. Over many successive mitoses, imagine how many there might be during bloom formation, cell size is progressively reduced. Uh, this one's supposed to be the same size as that one, so let me fix, fix that there. Again, this is the initial cell. I forgot to label that. As vegetative mitosis proceeds, in these um, diploid cells, they face an inevitable average reduction of cell size due to this petri dish construction. And their only escape from it is to have sex. So in, excuse me, in the life cycle of diatoms, sexual reproduction is an obligate step to escape the cell size constraint imposed by the structure of the mineralized, the silicious frustule that they cannot expand except by adding girdle bands to accommodate uh, cell extension at one axis. This particular feature here, the formation of an initial cell inside an oxyspore and the progressive reduction of cell size with each mitosis, that's true of centrix and it's true of penates. It's true, as far as I know, of all diatoms. However, penate diatoms are isogamous and they actually mate two cells ready for sex snuggle up to each other their valves open up and they trade essentially similar amoeboid gametes that then fuse to uh, ultimate to form a zygote that ultimately forms uh, the founder of a new vegetative lineage one of the presumed rationales for this difference in the way they mate is that most pennate diatoms are benthic or they are epiphytic or even epiphonal. That is, they live on surfaces and they can even, many pennates can crawl at, a little bit at least, and so they can in fact snuggle up to each other. Most centric diatoms, not all, but most centric diatoms are planktonic. Think about how much trouble diatoms have finding mates, especially since they can't swim, unless they have bloomed to great abundance. I wanna spend a few minutes working out explicitly the consequences of this Petri dish constraint, since it's inexorable that cell size reduces with successive mitotic divisions. 
I'm going to give this original epivalve a number that's zero. And this original hypovalve, that's one step down from it, right? So let's say that's a minus one. And this thing that fits inside that is two steps down, that's a minus two. So here's a minus one, here's a minus one, and here's a minus two. The purple ones are minus twos. And okay, there's a minus three, that yellow one in there. All right. We've got one valve that's at the original size, three that are at the minus one level, three that are at the minus two level, and one that's at the minus three level. So if we were to plot that out, we would have, uh, let's see, a, a histogram. I'll try and see if I can make this about as long as the original um, epivalve there. So there's one of those three of the next size class, three of the next size class, and so on. So that's the distribution after just two rounds of mitosis. Now, this must be exaggerated, okay? You know, without me having to tell you that if there are blooms that can fill the seas with brown goo, consisting of diatoms, obviously they're not undergoing this much proportional size reduction every division, or they'd have to go through, through sexual reproduction after maybe five or six my mitoses. The size reduction is very slight, far less than the difference between the lid and the Petri dish, okay? You can try and measure it if you're in the lab. Uh, okay, let's see what happens next here. Now, of course, this zero, if we continue down on the next line, that's going to divide to make a zero that's filled with a minus one size. Then this next one here, that minus one, it's gonna retain the minus one and uh, minus two and so forth. And don't worry, I won't talk through the whole thing. I'm gonna speed up and fill this out. But before I go any further, let's look here. There's the original epivalve. There's the original hypovalve. There's that yellow one. And every time I get a new smallest cell, Just kidding, I'm not really gonna fill those out. All right, again, there's the original participants. And a new littlest one. If that is the situation, uh, two to the third here, um, let's plot some of these out. So just going over here uh, and um, counting, we've got one, four, six, four, and one, the various types, okay, next. Okay, on average, they're getting smaller, right? Uh, does anybody recognize these numbers? So 
that corresponds to this population of valves here. Does anybody recognize those numbers? Maybe a few more. Anybody recognized it yet? I know at some point in grade school, everyone had to construct Pascal's triangle. And at some point in some algebra course, someone told you triumphantly that these are the coefficients of the binomial distribution. Okay, so from this progressive size reduction, if nothing else was going on, this is the distribution you'd expect. And the way it would behave is highly predictable. It's always going to be a symmetric distribution around some average. Now, there's always going to be the oldest valve in the population and the newest, weest little valve in the population. Okay, again, this exaggerates the degree of reduction with each division. Nevertheless, what's observed in a natural bloom is something is a distribution that's something like this. Not this symmetric binomial distribution, but something much more like this. There's nobody below a certain size. And there's a long tail like that. That is, instead of having a symmetrical binomial distribution, the way you would expect from this process if nothing else was going on, it's skewed to the small end. Why is that? Well, there are a couple of uh, reasons that we can think of right off. One is, what if small cells experience a growth advantage? That is, if they go through mitosis faster, in this case, why would that be? Well, the surface to volume ratio is different for small cells. Uh, perhaps they uh, speed up their division rate thereby. They might also get a nutrient uptake advantage, right? Surface to volume ratio being the major uh, <clears throat> limiting factor for nutrient uptake. Perhaps the same is true for, for light, uh, light absorption. Uh, Meanwhile, valves may not persist forever. That is, there might be some sort of lifetime to, a, to the fecal components or something like that. They might wear out. At any rate, this is the kind of natural distribution observed in blooms. All of these cells down here are piling up against some threshold where cell division becomes non-viable for this species, and sex is the only escape from it. So back to my, um, my brother's experience for a minute, finding that this model diatom that he intended to work with that had been in culture for decades had lost the ability to go through sex. Well, what did it do instead? Okay, life finds a way, like in Jurassic Park, right? So as it happens, culture senility for diatoms that are kept from having sex because, of course, if they're all clonal, then perhaps they'd like to have um, a different mating type, somebody else to mate with. Uh, at any rate, whatever the reason, diatoms kept from having sex in long-term culture, part of culture senility often involves evolving new ways to break out of this cell size constraint. In the case of the particular species he was working with, if I remember correctly, that strain had acquired the means to go through a failed cytokinesis and accomplish something like oxospore formation and thus reset cell size that way. So they do have potentially other tricks besides sex. Nevertheless, in nature, sex is probably the principal escape for uh, 
diatoms from the constraints of their own shell. So uh, let's review a few other, uh, just a summary of diatom ecology in brief. First of all, they need silica in the form of silicic acid to make this shell. Uh, they, in taking up silica during blooms, particularly in coastal waters, uh, they may deplete silica to undetectable levels, which limits not only their own growth, but the growth of anything else, you know, radiolarians, sponges, whatever, that depends on silica for its own skeleton. Diatoms sink, especially when they're dead, because they're rocks. They can't swim when they're alive. Oops, that's another consequence of being basically rocks on the outside. <clears throat> and many of their morphological adaptations, like spines or uh, other features like that, chain formation, uh, mucilage secretion, the ionic state of the vacuole, something like that, uh, are probably intended to slow sinking or regulate buoyancy, catch water flows, or avoid predation. Centric diatoms in the plankton, centric diatoms dominate the plankton, they probably hang out near the thermocline, not dividing very fast, um, where nutrients from deep water are available, uh, but the cells are light limited, awaiting upwelling that prompts blooms in coastal waters. In contrast, the motility of pennate diatoms, I guess I don't have one in view to point to, but the motility of pennate diatoms is presumed to be an adaptation to benthic habitats or epiphytic habitats, their motility allows them to stay in the light. Those of you taking the lab will see some dramatic examples of that, I hope. Over here, I'm gonna sketch the geological history of the concentration of silica in the oceans and also of CO2. These, of course, are Similarly, weak acids, we've all heard that CO2, in the form of the carbonate bicarbonate system, is the principal buffer in the modern ocean. Of course, it's in equilibrium with atmospheric CO2, and we all know that's a big problem, right? Okay, neither of these are terribly soluble, uh, well, uh, carbonate is, uh, silicate is not terribly soluble, but once upon a time, back in the Proterozoic, the ocean was probably saturated with silica. Depending on pH and temperature, that might mean two millimolar silica. So this is now 600 million years ago. This is about where animals show up, by the way, in the fossil record. Maybe they evolved earlier, but they became predominant then. This is the present. So once upon a time, the oceans were probably saturated with silica. And as sponges arose and started to take some of that, and also radiolarians, microorganism protists that use silica for their skeletons, they probably brought it down to, you know, something around a millimolar. But the advent of diatoms about 100 million years ago in the Cretaceous, oceanic silica took a nosedive. Diatoms, when they bloom, can take down silica concentrations to undetectable in surface waters perhaps a good estimate would be two micromolar. Uh, that's detectable, of course, but that's uh, in surface water is whether or not there happen to be any diatoms present. So silica is now limiting for not only the growth of diatoms, but 
also limits silicification by radiolarians and perhaps sponges, then, as now, the principal source of silica going into the ocean was the erosion of rocks, terrestrial rocks, delivered to the ocean by rivers. Something like seven teramoles, an enormous number, seven teramoles of silica is brought into the ocean every year and diatoms take it all down to the bottom. They fix carbon and they silicify their, their frustule. And when they die, the frustule sinks that silica and the carbon those diatoms have fixed, unless somebody eats them first, down to the bottom. So diatoms provide a major carbon sink as well. Let's now take a little plot of CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Now it's a little bit difficult to infer, but it is quite clear that at one time, CO2 levels were much higher than they are today. We're used to hearing about how pre-industrial CO2 levels were 300 something parts per million and we've spewed out so much from burning fossil fuels and forests and stuff that uh, now it's above 400 and climbing. So if this is a thousand parts per million, scary number that might happen if we keep burning stuff willy nilly. All right, our activities mean something like that. That's the little hockey stick that is now famous. Going back in time, again, it's a little bit difficult to reconstruct, but it's clear that CO2 was once much higher concentration than even we fear it could be. And it's had its ups and downs over geologic time. But let's just say it looks something like that. These are both weak acids. Once upon a time, not that long ago, like in the age of the dinosaurs, both of these were present and buffering the oceans. One of the consequences of increased CO2 in the atmosphere due to our activities, the ocean has to soak it up and CO2 dissolves in the ocean as carbonic acid with the consequence that you've all surely heard of that the oceans acidify. Now, what and to what extent ocean acidification actually affects ocean chemistry and the organisms that live in it is a subject of quite important debate. Will all the calcifying organisms just lose the ability to make shells? Well, probably not. Okay, some might find it harder, but, uh, and there are surely other unanticipated consequences, but it's probably not the case that all the sea urchins suddenly won't be able to make their shells. It is much more likely that there will be major faunal and floristic shifts in ways that are inconvenient to us, for one thing, but also perhaps inconvenient to those organisms that are shifted out of the way. Obviously, it's always favorable to somebody, right? At any rate, much legitimate debate surrounds the possible consequences of ocean acidification. What's clear is that silica is not coming back as a buffer. The ocean is perhaps now, as a consequence of diatom activity, much less resilient to the addition of CO2 to the atmosphere than perhaps it once was long ago. Curiously, the advent of diatoms coincides roughly mid Cretaceous and Cretaceous with the advent of the flowering plants on earth and in particular the grasses that have come to be one of the dominant vegetative biomes in terrestrial systems. So the continents are dominated by grasses which proliferate 
use silica mined from terrestrial soils to build their bodies and dry up and blow away as dust. Whereas marine waters are dominated by diatoms, the marine equivalent of grasses, both grazed heavily by herbivores. In the case of grasses, of course, the post-Cretaceous proliferation of mammals, especially large herds of, of, of ungulates, pushes out forests and savannas, leaving grasslands, which again, dry up and blow away, taking silica-rich dust into the ocean, fertilizing diatom blooms, almost as if they're conspiring to shape the chemistry of Earth to their liking, with our help. Okay, wait, I, I know one diatom joke. Let me draw a diatom. A nice uh, spiny ketoceros will do. Wicked looking salacious spines sticking out of it. Okay, here's the joke. What did one copepod say to the other copepod? Mm-mm. These diatoms, they sure are salacious. <laughs>